Good evening, good evening, good evening. Welcome to the Uplift Bible Study. I'm Pastor Marquez Ball, the lead pastor at an amazing church, at a phenomenal church, at an uplifting church, Uplift Church in Laurel, Maryland. So I want to say to you, uh, welcome. Thank you so much for coming in and uh, sharing in this Bible study uh, with us. So I want to uh, kick us off with some praise and with some uh, worship. And then we're going to uh, dive in as I set up a few other uh, components to make sure the uh, YouTube channel is live as well. Make sure we good to go. Come on in, y'all. Come on in. 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 Y'all ready? All right. To, uh, to rush in today because I was stuck in traffic. So I'm so glad to finally make it. Paul, what's up, man? Welcome, 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 welcome. Um, one of the challenges with being live stream, we have to make sure we are in the location uh, to go live. So welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for coming on in. Do me a favor as you're coming in, will you go ahead, share this uh, live stream, invite others to take part uh, and to watch as well. As we are dealing with uh, doubt, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible teach uh, about uh, doubt? Should a Christian doubt? Uh, can a Christian doubt? Paul, you're not the only one that's uh, pushing in late a little bit today. Uh, Bertha Page, how are you? Jamaica, what's up? How are you? We're giving others just a moment to uh, to get on in. I know for me it was rough today because of uh, because of traffic. Living in the DMV area, uh, DC, Maryland, Virginia, uh, traffic is just a beast. Uh, amen, amen. Well, welcome to those who are coming on in. All right, all right, all right. Ooh. All right, all right. So again, welcome. Thank you so very, very much for taking this time to uh, share in the Uplift Bible Study. I'm uh, so glad to greet each of you on this evening. Um, for those who are watching um, on, on Facebook, for those who are watching on our app, welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, for those who are watching on the app every now and then, for whatever reason, um, YouTube does not pick up the stream. Not sure why, uh, but I know you can definitely uh, hear me, so uh, we invite you to definitely keep uh, tuning in uh, there as well. Um, 
I'm going to uh, give us a brief recap of what we've been sharing, and then uh, we will um, continue our series called Things You Can't Talk About uh, at Church. There are some of us who know that there are some things you just cannot talk about uh, at church. And so I'm going to uh, share it in one more uh, place. I want to make sure I get my own uh, footing so that I'm not rushing. Um, as I was rushing to get here. All right. Should a Christian doubt? What does a Christian do when, when they have uh, doubt? Paul, uh, is there inviting you to introduce yourself as others are, are jumping on? I know we, um, we kicked off today about uh, six minutes or so uh, late as I was rushing uh, in traffic. And so um, definitely invite you to, uh, to come on in. So... Uh, how do we handle uh, doubt? That's what we're going to deal with tonight. So let's begin with prayer, then I'll recap uh, on our last week's lesson, and then we'll unpack our lesson for uh, this evening. Let me see if I can get that a little better. All right. And then we'll unpack our lesson for this evening. Let's see here. It's a little high. There we go. A little better. Let's begin with prayer. Lord God, we come before you now, and we say thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity to grow closer to you. I pray now, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit would fill the atmosphere where we are. Help us, Lord God, to push past all distractions. Help us, Lord God, to even push past all of our worries, all of our concerns, all uh, that may stress us, Lord God. Help us to push past that so that we may truly encounter you. Help us even in this Bible study experience, Lord God, uh, to grow closer to you. We say even now, Holy Spirit, you are welcome uh, to feel the atmosphere where we are. You are welcome to transform the place. Lord God, I pray now that you would feel this, uh, this study, Lord God. I pray that you would feel someone's living room, feel someone's uh, kitchen, Lord God. Somebody may be sitting at work watching or listening. I pray that you would feel their work environment, Lord God. Somebody's probably looking from their phone. I pray that you would feel and transform wherever they are, Lord God, that we may truly be able to encounter you, even while having Bible study via live stream. We want to, to feel your presence and your power on this evening. This is indeed our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray and we thank you. Amen and amen. All right, so again, we are in a Bible study um, series called uh, Things You Can't Talk About at Church. And there was a couple of things we've dealt with. We talked about, we talked about rape. We've talked about gluttony. Uh, overeating. Um, we've we talked about mental illness. Uh, last week, we, we talked about slavery. Uh, so I want to recap that. We talked about what does the Bible say about slavery. And I uh, shared with you an Old Testament um, passage uh, with the word uh, eved. Uh, it's a Hebrew word meaning slave. And how that word um, in Hebrew context had multiple layers to it. Uh, and so... Um, uh, that, that word, um, Yvette, had multiple layers to it. And so sometimes when we think of slave, particularly from our Western context, we are thinking about a person who does not have any freedoms at all. Uh, however, in the Hebrew context, it talked about the year of Jubilee and how in the seventh year uh, that slaves had to go free and uh, whatever debt they may have had, someone may have been working off a of debt, uh, was to be totally canceled. That was one understanding of the Hebrew context. Then there's others where it was was a person who in essence was enslaved but the word used was simply slave you could work um to get something that you wanted um so we looked at that but then we jumped to the new testament passages where paul talks about slave obey your master and trying to figure out well what did paul mean and i shared that Paul um, was one who would, who would have studied the Hebrew context and how uh, his understanding of slave would have been very much uh, shaped from his religious context. And so we, uh, we dealt with that um, on last week. We then talked about how uh, in the 1600 version, 1611 version of the King James uh, Bible, 
there was only two references to the word slave, once in the Old and one in the New Testament. But by the time we got to New Revised Standard Version, it was like 166 references. And so we kind of unpacked that on last week. And so um, this week, uh, we're going to talk about a tough subject, and that is doubt. I love the Lord, but what about this? What about this? What about this doubt? Um, you know, some of y'all, some of y'all grew up, some of us rather grew up, and you were taught, you don't question God. So if you got doubt, you the one with the problem. It's your fault. Uh, you haven't matured enough. Uh, yeah, what up, uh, Pastor Kellogg, man? Thank you for, for tuning in. And so we want to unpack uh, this understanding of doubt. So I want you to do me a favor, right? Um, those who are coming on in, uh, if you grew up where you've heard the phrase like, uh, don't question God, go ahead, click the little like button, give me the amen. Like, yeah, I, I, I know that. I've experienced that. You had a grandmama, an usher, a pastor, a deacon tell you, you don't question God. You just accept it as it is. Kellogg is saying, yeah, 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 I, I've experienced that. Anybody else you've heard, don't question God as if questions to God were in some sort of a way an offense to God. Like God is going to be mad at you for asking questions. Just believe with no questions, all right? Some of us grew up hearing that. So tonight, I want to help us as Christians, as believers, deal with the fact that we go to church regularly, sing gospel songs regularly, but there are times when we have doubt. So what do we, what do we say about that? How do we deal with that? So I want to let you know at the outset, right, what we're going to do first of all is deal with some cultural shifts, some societal changes that, that even informs why we have doubt. Okay, so I want to help us to do that. Then I'm going to give us some biblical examples of doubt. And then we're going to unpack one particular scenario. So I want you to know now, I'm going to, Paul is going to uh, hopefully give you all some of, well, Paul, you can post uh, most of it as I'm going through it, as we talk about some of these cultural shifts, 18th century, 19th, 20th century, to 21st century, how we got to where we are, and maybe some things impact you and you don't even know it's impacting you. Maybe some of the doubt you have is because of the era within which we live, E-R-A. So I want us to help us to, to get um, some of that. So I want to deal with um, terms that will help us place doubt and Christianity in perspective, okay? There was once a time, and I, I didn't live in this time, but uh, <laughs> part of me wonder what it would have been like. There was once a time when theology, theology is a big word that simply means the study of God. Uh, theo, uh, meaning Godology, study of. Uh, the study of God, the study of God was the king uh, in academic society. So if you went to Oxford or, or Cambridge or even Princeton, these schools were really founded to help you study God. Um, it was when... When theology, a person who got a master's of divinity or a doctorate uh, in, in divinity, a PhD uh, in theology, was like the man. It would have been primarily the man at the time. You were, you were it. You helped shape society. Now, eh, get online, you know, put in, you know, I want a degree in theology.com. And you know I mean, it ain't rocket science now. People just get paper mill degrees. But there was once a time when... You were um, viewed as someone that was on a high level because the study of God was important, okay? Um, that was then. Now, you know, if you're a scientist, you're the man, you're the woman. If you, you know, a computer programmer, you're the man, you're the woman. Science has now taken over as, in essence, the king in academic circles. And so I want us to see how we got there and how that informs our Christian perspectives as well as our doubt. Okay? Um, so for one, uh, we have to look at uh, what's called the Enlightenment period, Enlightenment era, 18th century. Uh, it was an enlightened, an intelligent movement, an intellectual movement 
uh, which dominated the world of ideas in Europe in the 18th century, because before then they were in a uh, medieval or medieval uh, time, a medieval era. Uh, so the Enlightenment came about, and that included um, a lot of ideas centered on reason. Okay, matter of fact, let's, let's see, uh, have a little fun. Let's see if I can grab one. Uh, oh, here we go. Let's see. Uh, you had someone like Immanuel Kant. Uh, religion within the limits of reason alone. So um, this was the, the Enlightenment uh, era. The Enlightenment was, was marked by an emphasis on the scientific method. If I cannot reason it to be factual, then it is a problem. It was a method of reductionism. What is the simplest form we can get to? That was the Enlightenment period, and during that time, religion became something to question. Orthodox religion uh, was under the microscope during the Enlightenment time, okay? From there, that was the 18th century. From there, now remember, for those who are joining on, I want you to know I'm helping us to understand how we got to even some of our concepts of doubt with regard to religion. So before the Enlightenment period, um, what a preacher said, what a pastor said, um, was taken as absolute matter of fact. This was, you don't question it. It was, if they said it, it's from God. Enlightenment era said, let's see if we can scientifically prove it. Um, so that was that. Then in 19th and 20th century, you had what's called modernity. Modernity is a term used by, um, those who kind of study the humanities and social sciences, uh, it was a historical period. It's also called just the modern era. It dealt with some changes in our social and cultural norms. It, it, it came out of the Enlightenment period. So that was one shift we saw 19th and 20th century. We live, well, first of all, let me give you what one theologian uh, said about uh, modernity. Um, Thomas uh, Oden put it this way. Four fundamental values of modernity. This is important to help us to understand why, I would say even why many of millennials have left church because of doubt, because I don't believe it. This will get us to understand this. Okay, so these cultural shifts, these, these um, societal changes. So modernity, 19th and 20th century. Paul, you can post those... Um, Four fundamental values, uh, if you haven't yet. So, um, one was called, a term called moral relativism. Now, these are a lot of isms about to come, so I'm going to pull them all together for us. Moral relativism came in the 19th to 20th century, which said um, that what is right, what is considered to be the right thing to do, what is ethically or morally right, is determined or dictated by culture or someone's social location. So, for example, um, this would fit into, I'm taking this course, um, dealing with societal changes. And one was talking about in India what they would have to do to get people to stop doing what's called open defecation. They would just use the bathroom wherever. Because their culture, their social location, rather, said it wasn't wrong. There was no problem with that. So they're saying moral relativism simply says what is right is dictated by your culture, by your social location. Okay. Um, then there's another one that came out of this era, which is autonomous individualism, which, which assumes that moral authority comes from within. I, I am my own Moral authority. I, in and of myself, determine what is right and what is wrong. It does not come from anyone else, okay? Then there is um, narcissistic hedonism. This is still relevant today. I told y'all, it's a lot of isms. Watch this. Narcissistic hedonism, which focuses on pleasure for you. I want to get all that I can while I can, as long as I can. And if I can get more than I can, give me that too. I want pleasure 
for me. If I can I have seven or eight wives? Can 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 I, can I have um four or five husbands? I I just everybody is all about all about me. All right? Narcissistic hedonism. Um we see this played out um we see this played out We'll see it played out up until at least November uh, in America. Narcissistic hedonism. I'll let you make that up for yourself. You can figure that out, right? And so then there's another one which is called uh, reductive naturalism, which reduces what is reliably known to what can be seen, heard, or investigated. I won't believe it unless I can see it with my own eyes, hear it with my own ears, are investigated to re to deduce that it's factually true. I've got to have some scientific proof. Find Noah's Ark for me. If you don't find Noah's Ark with some bodies or something, it ain't happened. I can't believe. I don't care what book you give me. It's a made up story. Find the fruit that Eve ate. Reductive naturalism would suggest you gotta prove it to me. So that that's the ideas that kind of came out of modernity. Now again, for those who are coming in, we're building up to kind of how we get our doubt, right? So let me let me before I even get to post-modernity, I want you to see what we see happening here. So enlightenment says uh use scientific method to prove something. Modernity says what is right is determined by your culture or your social location, okay? Um, uh, narcissistic hedonism, do something that's going to please you. It's all about you, okay? Then we get to post-modernity, which is what um, um, social psychologists or what have you or so, uh, sociologists would say we're living in now. So post-modernity uh, is a philosophy that says absolute truth like, absolute, like, this is factually true. Absolute truth does not exist. Absolute truth does not exist. Postmodernity says absolute truth does not exist. Um, uh, so this thing here, nah, bruh, this is just some, it ain't absolute truth. Nah, you, you can take it, you can leave it. Um, absolute truth does not exist. And so, therefore, this must be doubted. This, this is the Bible. This got to be doubted this, because absolute truth doesn't exist. That's the culture that we live in now. And so, this then caused people to deny long-held beliefs and convictions, okay? In today's society, uh, postmodernism has led to relativism and the idea that all truth is relative. What's true for you is true for you, but it don't make it true for me. We see this playing out so much in society. So if you say the sky is blue and I say it's pink, then we're both right. That's postmodernity. <laughs> There's no absolute truth. Everything is everything is relative. Now, I want us to understand something. So that it helps us to understand there is no real right and wrong. It's all subjective and whatever society says is right becomes right. And whatever society says is wrong becomes wrong. And so therefore, the Bible can no longer be an authority on anything. Postmodernity. So we see how we built up to this from enlightenment to modernity that says let's question uh, everything to postmodernity, which definitely says, for one, there is no absolute truth. Um, um, and so uh, because there is no absolute truth, there can be no absolute authority on anything. Everything is relative. Now, um, these major Societal, philosophical shifts, enlightenment, modernity, postmodernity has caused there to be a rejection of absolute truth, which causes many people to reject the Bible. Now, the difficulty comes uh, when I have been now, we have all now been conditioned by an educational system that says, question everything. Um, if you cannot factually prove it, then it cannot be true. 
um, truth then is relative. Your truth and my truth may be very different truths. And because we've got a generation that has been totally shaped in this from primary education all the way up to your umpteenth degree, this is the era within which we live. And then we show up in church and we hear Jesus walked on water. And you're thinking scientifically that can't be done. You're hearing uh, Jesus got up from the grave. And you're thinking, I know, okay, I'm supposed to believe in God, but scientifically, though, that just don't it work. And so because I cannot see it, hear it, scientifically prove it, then it can't show me the clothes that he's worn. Matter of fact, I need to go over there. I need to walk in the tomb just to make sure that he's not there. These are things from our culture that has produced the level of doubt that we have. Okay. Difficulty comes then when we can no longer separate our education and our Christian faith. And sometimes we have been led to believe that to be Christian means to deny your intellect. To have faith then means to be void of intelligence. And so you've got to have dumb faith. You gotta have faith that rejects all intellect. Faith that just cannot be proven in any kind of way. If you don't have that, then you ain't got faith. Christianity then, some would suggest, requires you to dumb yourself down. Okay, um, I want to help us wrestle with doubt. Questions have to be asked. Um, if I doubt, does it offend God? If I've got questions, does it offend God? I'm going to tell you, I ask weird questions when I read the Bible. Uh, Eve spoke to the serpent. I want to know what language they spoke. I want to know when God cursed the serpent to crawl on the ground. What what would he did he fly before or not? I'm saying I, I want to know how big was the tree. My pastor, matter of fact, uh, Dr. Evans, he asked kind of weird questions. So um, I remember one time we were sitting down. And he asked this question that messed me up, dealing with Adam and Eve. And he said, when the serpent talked to Eve and told her to go ahead and eat the fruit, I wonder how long did they talk. You see, we automatically assume that they had just talked. It was a real quick conversation. She just ran with it. Were they friends? Did he build up trust between them? <laughs> These are things um, that we can truly ask questions that we can inquire about. And I just did that with Genesis. Jesus is supposed to be a fully God, but then Jesus gets on the cross and says, My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Who are you talking to? These are questions that if you have an intellect, you can begin to wrestle with these things. I want to share with us, and as we're wrestling with Christianity and doubt, I want you to understand something. That doubt is not bad. Say it one more time. Doubt is not bad. Your doubt. Ain't going to make God mad. Ain't going to make God kill you. It ain't going to make you less of a Christian. Doubt is not bad. But actually, it can help you grow in your faith if you handle your doubt the right way. I'm going to say that one more time. Doubt, as a Christian, is not bad. As a matter of fact, God can use your doubt to help you grow in your faith. I want to deliver somebody tonight who've been taught that if you've got doubt, you're a weak Christian. If you got doubt, some kind of way you're offending God. No, your doubt could actually drive you to be closer to God. Watch this. One theologian put it this way. I have to read it slow, Paul. You can put his statement up there. If ours meaning our faith, uh, is an examined faith, we should be unafraid to doubt it. He says this, if doubt is eventually justified, we were believing what clearly was not worth believing. 
But if doubt is answered and our faith has grown stronger, it, it knows God more certainly and it can enjoy God more deeply. When you have gone on a journey to find something and you find it, oh my God, the rejoicing. Doubt then becomes a quest for you to find out more. That's what it does as long as you allow it to do that. Um, in other words, all of us have doubt at some point, uh, but instead of seeing it as a weakness, we see it as something that sets us on a quest to know more about God. Um, I am convinced that a lot of people are shallow in their Christianity, shallow in their faith, because they've not given themselves room to doubt and taken doubt as a journey. Rather, I accept what Grandmama and them told me, even if I've got my scientific sort of doubts, I accept it and I never go on a journey to learn more. Because of that, you stay shallow. It never becomes real for you. Okay, um, you may be shocked to learn this. I'm going to mention a couple of names here. You may be shocked to learn that some of the greatest leaders in Christendom had doubt. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, has a famous sermon talking about a coffee cup. And he talked about one night he came home, it was late, he was tired, um, but he had a lot on his mind. He tried to go to sleep, had a lot on his mind. He got up out of bed, went and made himself a cup of coffee. And while he had a cup of coffee going, he got a phone call. And the phone call, person on the end of the line said to him, uh, this is what the person said, I'm going to use the phrase, so don't get mad at me, it's the N-word. He said, nigga, if you don't leave town, we're going to kill you and your family. That's what the person said, racist and enraged person. And King had been getting these calls before, but for whatever reason, this weighed on him. King said he sat down over the coffee cup. Now, you got to understand, he's a preacher. He's been preaching. He grew up in church. He's the son of a preacher, the grandson of preachers. And King said over that coffee cup, God had to become real for him. It was no longer daddy's faith, mama's faith, granddaddy, grandmama's faith that was going to get him through. It had to be real for him. So in other words, matter of fact, um, when I say Dr. King, man, I, I found out all kind of stuff about even when he first got ordained and what he believed about uh, Christ's immaculate conception and what he believed about the resurrection. He was on a journey. This is why he studied theology and got a PhD in it. He had questions and he sought to answer them. King was one. Not only was King, C.S. Lewis was another one. C.S. Lewis wrote screw tape letters. He uh, wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, but he was known for having doubt. As a matter of fact, C.S. Lewis said one of the major problems of Christianity was, was apologists. Those who studied apologetics to faithfully defend the Christian faith and try to remove all doubt. But doubt for him was what drove him. Not only that, Mother Teresa had doubt. Martin Luther had doubt so much, y'all. Martin Luther was one of the, the founder uh, of the Protestant Reformation. He's the reason why you got something other than Catholic. He had so much doubt that it drove him to depression at times. He felt like he was losing his own Christianity by his level of doubt. But that drove him to ask more questions. That's why he said that there's a priesthood for all believers. Because he doubted something. And in his doubt, we got the Protestant Reformation, right? So uh, doubt isn't bad when you go on a journey. The truth of the matter is that we can all come up with excuses as to why we don't ask difficult questions about our faith. And that may be our unwillingness to grow. I don't want to know. I don't want to find out. If it's not readily available for me, then I just won't get it. And as a result, you don't grow as a Christian. Okay. Um, First Peter chapter number three, verse 15 puts it this way. We should always be ready to give a reason or to give a defense for the hope that we have. You should always be able to say, I believe it because of this. Not because of grandmama and them. Not, not because I just grew up in church, but because I've sought God for myself. 
That's what helps me to believe. So let's look at a couple of biblical examples about doubt. I'm going to unpack one, then we'll be, uh, we'll be through. I'm already like, wow, I mean, like, okay, so uh, let's look at a couple of examples. Genesis chapter number 17. Genesis chapter number 17. Before I go into um, those, are there any questions? Are there any questions so far? Paul, thank you so much for, for sharing. Um, Paul is an amazing, faithful brother. Uh, questions? Luther challenged the Catholic Church. Uh, his, yes, absolutely, Margie. Um, Luther was amazing. Uh, and Luther was just on a major quest to learn more about God. Um, and he was not willing to accept, but just someone just handed it to him. He took his doubt, and that became a journey for him, a lifelong journey for him. All right? Any other questions, questions, comments, concerns real quick before I dive into some scriptural passages? Questions, comments, concerns. All right? So let's look at Genesis chapter number 17, verses uh, 15 through 21. Now, this is dealing with, with uh, my boy, Abram, Abraham, Abraham. Genesis chapter number 17, verses 15 through 21. It says, then God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and indeed I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nation. Kings of people will come from her. Verse 17 says, <laughs> Then Abraham, y'all, I need you to picture this. God has said, Abram, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. You're going to have a child. Matter of fact, your wife is going uh, to give birth to multiple nations. Kings will come from her. Verse 17 says, Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed. God is speaking to him, and Abraham doesn't chuckle. <laughs> Abraham doesn't just laugh. Abraham goes as far as falling on his face face laughing. <laughs> Bro, you got jokes, God. This is Abraham. Verse 17. Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, will a child be born to a man 100 years old? And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? <laughs> God, this don't make no sense. I got doubt. I don't believe that. Verse 17. Verse 18 says, And Abram said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. But God said, No, Sarah. No, but Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. I'm going to stop right there. I want you to see how Abraham, father of the faith, Abraham, who believed and it was credited to him as faith, Hebrew says, Abraham fell on his face laughing at God when God told him what he was going to do. Have you been there before when God shared something with you that seems so absolutely, totally, completely, and utterly outrageous that you would just fall on your face laughing because it made no sense? So brother Abraham is, chapter number 18, Sarah hears it and Sarah laughs because she just knows this don't make no sense. Let's look at John. Chapter number 20. Let's jump over to the New Testament. John, chapter number 20, verses 24 through 29. John, chapter number 20, verses 24 through 29. This is one of my, this is, this is the famous one here. Uh, y'all know this story. John, chapter number 20, verses 24 through 29. Y'all know this story. As a matter of fact, brother got his nickname for doubting. He says, but Thomas, I, I, this is critical. <laughs> but Thomas, who is Thomas? One of the 12. The brother that was a disciple who was with Jesus? That dude, Thomas, one of the 12 called Didymus was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see. But he said to them, unless I see his hands. 
the imprints of the nails and put my fingers in the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came uh, the doors having been shut. It talks about, in essence, Jesus kind of walking through with the doors shut. Now, I need you to, I need y'all, I need y'all to picture this. Okay, they're in the room, doors shut. Bam, Jesus shows up. All right. Um, so clearly something is unique about this situation. That ain't enough to Thomas though. Um, so after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, "Peace be with you." Then he said to Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here with your hand and put it into my side and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. All right. Um, one more, James. Chapter number one, verses five through eight, because now this is going to mess you up a little bit. James, right, let's, let's just go to Mark, chapter number nine, chap, chapter number nine, verse 24. Mark, chapter number nine, verse number 24. Let's do that one. My time is winding now, because I still got to unpack a passage of scripture for you. Mark, chapter number nine. Mark, chapter number nine, verse number 24. Another famous one. Here it is. Verse number 24 says, Let's start with verse number 23. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Okay. Um, these are just some passages of scripture that shows some portions of doubt in the Bible. There's another one, Luke chapter number seven. This is why I want to kind of hang my hat. Luke chapter number seven, verses 18 through 23. We're going to unpack that. Luke chapter number seven, verses 18 through 23. Luke chapter number seven, verses 18 through 23. Here's what it says. The disciples of John reported to him all these things. Summoning two of his disciples, John sent them to the Lord, meaning Jesus, saying, Are you the expected one, or do we look for someone else? When the men came to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, Are you the expected one, or do we look for someone else? At the very time, he cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits, and he gave sight to many who were blind, and he answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he who does not take offense to me. All right, now, let me unpack uh, this a little bit, right? Because this is interesting. Um, John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, <laughs> baptized Jesus. Before he baptized him, he talked about there's one coming whose sandals I'm not even worthy uh, to untie. Jesus comes. Jesus is baptized by John, and for the first time after baptizing somebody, John sees the sky part. John sees dove float down, and John hears, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Okay. Uh, there's word about Jesus healing people, and opening blinded eyes, and casting out, this ain't never been done before. And John sends people to say, is it you or should we expect somebody else? Here's why this is important. They lived in a time when Jesus lived. They were able to experience um, 
the transformations that were happening in people's lives. They were able to experience the eye openings. They were able to experience people get healed because of Jesus. At the time, John is in jail. John hears these reports and still has to send somebody to check. Here's what I need you to understand, my brothers and my sisters, and I got to leave you here. Um, throughout the New Testament particularly, whenever you see doubt show up, what's amazing is it's believers who doubt. Jesus would always say to his disciples, oh, ye of little faith. It's amazing that they were the ones who doubted. It's amazing that that John can baptize Jesus and see the sky open up and hear the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And still, he's got questions. It's amazing that Thomas could be one of the 12 disciples and still he had doubt. But in none of these situations did God say you aren't saved because of it. In none of these situations um, did they some kind of way become less of a disciple or less of a follower of Jesus Christ because of their doubt. Here's what John did. When he had questions, he sent someone, because he couldn't because he's in jail, to get the answers. His questions led him to a quest. My brothers and my sisters, it ain't that deep. It ain't that heavy. Your doubts are real. Um, let's see. Um, Margie asked, let's look at Second Chronicle, uh, Second Corinthians chapter number 10, verses, verse 15. Uh, she asked about this. Let's look at Second Corinthians chapter 10, um, verse number 5. I'm going to turn there. Let's see if we can unpack. So this is Paul's writing. Technically, this is Paul's third letter to Corinth. His second one technically got got lost. And so this one right here, the one we're reading at 2 Corinthians, his, his follow-up. Uh, so let's see, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 5. Paul describes himself and he says this. Um, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And let's go further. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your disobedience is complete. Okay, so here we, we're dealing with Paul's writing. And this one right here really deals with uh, every thought that exalts itself above God. And he's saying we're taking those captive. I'm not sure here that he's dealing with doubts. I want to read it fully in this context to make sure we deal with it properly. Um, he says, Now I, Paul, myself urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I... Who am meek when face to face with you, but bold toward you when absent. He's a, in other words, he's talking about when I'm not with y'all, I write real strong. I ask that when I present, that when I am present, present, I need not be bold with the confidence with which I propose to be uh, courageous against some. We regard who regard us as if we walk according to the flesh, for though we walk in the flesh. We do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Fortresses. We are destroying uh, speculations in every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So again, here he's dealing with those things that try to destroy uh, the existence of God. These things that are in essence from the pits of hell is what Paul is saying. Um, God in, in this then is using the foolish things to confound the wise. Not only that, uh, God is said, Paul is saying our faith is stronger even than the things that the devil tries to use um, to prove or, or to suggest that God does not exist. And so I'm going to give it to you um, like this. And I'm, I'm going to leave you. So um, I'm a country boy. Um, my grandmother raised me until I was 11 years old. Uh, my grandmother, y'all, um, she picked cotton for a little while in Louisiana, and uh, she was the help. Um, she was the help for a lady, white lady named Miss Boyd. I still remember this. She cleaned her house. 
um, and uh, and Miss Whitehead. Sorry, I mean, Miss Boyd and Miss Whitehead. So uh, she cleaned her house. My grandmother was the help. My grandmother didn't learn to to read and write. My grandmother uh, did not go to school. My undergrads in biblical studies. My grandmother. Didn't go to school for biblical studies. She didn't get a master's of divinity nor any of the doctorate. My grandmother didn't get none of that. My, I have a Greek Bible over here. My grandmother would look at that and it would be Greek to her. She don't know that. She don't know Hebrew. She's never studied Immanuel Kant. She, she's never studied Paul Tillich or Martin Luther. She, she's never really opened the Bible, y'all, and read like Genesis to Revelation. My grandmother could not do that to this day. Here's what my grandmother would tell you. She could sit in anybody's philosophy class. She, she could sit in any class that dealt with the creation. And they, they would say it's a myth. And they would tell her, uh, you know, that, that the story uh, of the flood is actually um, an ancient Near Eastern story from Mesopotamia. They, she, she could hear all of that. She could hear all of that, y'all. And my grandmama would say, well, baby, uh, that might be true. My grandma said, I've never read Genesis or Revelation. I have never studied theology or any other theology. I cannot tell you Hebrew nor Greek. My grandma would put it this way. My grandma would say, you can't make me doubt him because I know too much about him. Grandma, what do you mean? I don't know necessarily about him from reading Genesis or, or reading Romans or even reading 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. That's not why I know too much about it. No, 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 no. My grandmama would say, you can't make me doubt him because I know too much about him. I know what he's done for me. When doubt creeps up, when science creeps up, when your fears and your anxiety creeps up, you ought to have something that says, I know what is done for me. When philosophy professors try to tell you that religion is the opium of the masses, you ought to tell them that even if they say that, I know what is done for me. I know when I was hungry, he blessed me with food. I know when I did not know how I was going to keep my lights on when I prayed about it and they stayed on. I know God did that. I know when I did not know how I was going to pay my tuition some kind of way. God sent money my way and I cannot explain it, but God did it. When I looked for a job and I could not do it on my own, my resources had run out, but some kind of way God showed up and worked it out. You can't make me doubt him because I know too much about it. I know what he's done for me. My time is up. Preferably you've been blessed by this. Um, there was a lot that I wanted to share, but I rushed in. Um, and I really just could not get to all of what I wanted to share. Um, so I, I will I will give you all a uh, just a quick overview of some articles I pulled. Uh, one is called In Search of Meaning. You can Google it. Hopefully you can find it yourself. In Search of Meaning, some thoughts on belief, doubt, and well-being. Uh, this one deals with the fact that any uh, developing person psychologically has doubts, and those doubts is what causes him or her to actually develop, right? Um, you doubted some things that your mom and them told you, and that's why you tried it. No, son, that's going to burn you. And then you put your hand in there. That's because you needed to learn for yourself. Your relationship with God ought not be built on what mama and them said. Ought not be built on what grandmama and them told you. You need to know him for yourself. All right. Um, so that, that's one. Um, there was another one. Um, it was actually a, a lecture um, dealing with Christians and doubt. I didn't get a chance to go through um, all of those, um, but hopefully you've been blessed um, by this uh, moment, this time of sharing. So here's what I want to do. Uh, I want to invite you, if you've been blessed by this, to be a blessing uh, to uplift church. If you've learned uh, from this, if you've been challenged, let me, let me do this before I even do the offering. If this has been helpful for you and this, if this has given you the freedom to doubt, and uh, the responsibility to be on a quest to grow in your faith. 
big cost you've got down. Will you go ahead, click the like button. I want to know um, that it actually resonated with you. If this helped you to understand that doubt isn't a bad thing, but it can actually lead you to grow spiritually as you're trying to find answers for yourself. Go ahead, click the like button a couple times. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, so very much. I want to make sure that it's resonating uh, with people as well. All right, so listen, uh, I want to invite you, my brothers and my sisters, to be a blessing to uh, Uplift Church. Paul uh, is going to post the uh, give link, upliftmd.com forward slash give. I would love it if you would be a blessing. Go ahead, click the link, take an active part in being a blessing. Definitely invite you uh, to do that uh, as well. If you're watching right now and you started this study because you've had some doubts, um, you haven't even accepted Jesus Christ because some of the things just didn't make sense for you about him dying on a cross to, to save uh, uh, you. I want you to notice, my brothers and my sisters, your doubt about him dying on the cross, your doubt about him being raised from the dead doesn't negate the fact that it happened. You can doubt that the sun is in the sky. It won't remove it. Um, you can doubt um, that a million dollars actually exists. It doesn't get rid of it. You can doubt um, that you've got a headache. It won't make it go away. My point is this, my brothers and my sisters. Your doubt does not negate Jesus' work on Calvary's cross for you. Here's what I would encourage you to do. I would encourage you to stretch out a little bit and recognize I've got doubts about how it happened, but I believe that God is able to make it happen. If that's you, my brother, my sister, and you've never accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior because for your own little scientific mind that has been shaped and molded by post-modernity that you just could not conceive of the fact that somebody would do this for somebody like you, that he would die for you, <laughs> I want you to know, my brothers and my sisters, even with post-modernity, it does not get rid of the fact that he loved you enough to die for you. If you have never accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior, I invite you to do that today by simply repeating these words after me. Dear Lord, I admit that I am a sinner. I admit that I've fallen short. But I accept that you sent Jesus to die for me. I accept that you raised him on the third day to save me. And because of that, I am saved. I believe that. I receive that. Even if I don't totally understand it, I receive it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now listen, my brothers and my sisters, if you pray that prayer for the first time, Paul has already given you a link, admin at upliftmd.com. Shoot us an email letting us know, hey man, I pray that prayer for the first time. We want to give you some more resources to help you actually grow uh, in your faith. Paul has also posted there um, the uh, Bible reading plan. We encourage you to actually open it. Read it. Go on a journey to learn more about God. Then maybe you're watching and you came in with some doubts and you felt uncomfortable because you had doubts. I want you to know this, my brothers and my sisters. If God cannot handle your doubts, he's not God. Your doubts, your, your questions, do not scare God. He can handle them. So go ahead and ask them. Go ahead and be on a search to find them out. Ask questions about the text. For example, Peter walking on water. How far did he walk? That's a good one. I, 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 I want to preach that. Some preacher you may be watching. How far did he walk? This is amazing. Did he, did he take 15 steps on the water and then began to sink? You know why that's important? Because the question has to be asked. Did he swim back or when Jesus pulled him up, did he walk back? Ha! Even after falling down, I still walk on water again. Listen, we can ask questions, y'all. This is okay. All right. Um, so I want to pray if, if, um, you came in with some doubts. I want to pray for you as well that you will see doubt as an opportunity for you to ask questions of God, to go on a journey that would deepen uh, your faith, that would deepen uh, your relationship with God. Lord God, we come before you and we, we say thank you that you <laughs> caused all things to work together for our good, that you can take our doubts. 
You can take our unanswered questions and set us on a journey. And in that journey, Lord God, we learn more about you. We learn more about your attributes. We learn more about your love. We, we learn more about your righteousness and your justice. Lord God, help us to be believers that are not shallow by simply accepting what somebody else has said about you. But Lord God, help us uh, to be like the people uh, in Samaria after the woman at the well came and said, come see a man that's told me all that I've ever done. Their response became, we believe now, not because of what you have said, but because We've seen and heard with our own eyes. Help us to have that kind of testimony that our relationship with you is not built on what someone else says, but it's built on our quest to know you more. Lord, we love you. We praise you. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. My brother, my sister, I pray uh, that you have been uh, blessed by uh, that experience. Um, so listen, we go out with a little bit of praise, a little bit of worship. Uh, so let's have some fun. Listen. that you've been blessed by your study. Hope this challenged you a little bit. Uh, it's, it's justified your doubts. If you've been blessed by this, I encourage you, go ahead and share it. Invite someone else to begin a quest with you to answer some questions about your faith, to go deeper in your relationship with God. I will bless the Lord. I invite you to join me tomorrow morning as well, 7 a.m., as we kick off our Wednesday mornings with prayer and with praise. If you're in the DMV area, join us at Uplift Church Sunday morning, 10.30 a.m. We're in a new series, part two of the series called We Are Family. I would love for you to join us this Sunday as well. God bless you. Until next week. Peace. Paul, thank you, man. You're awesome. Please.